Welcome to my YouTube channel. In this presentation, Operative Treatment of Dental Caries in the Primary Dentition, we delve into the foundational aspects of our practice in Part 1, exploring the philosophy of care, the nuances of diagnosis and treatment planning, and the indispensable role of rubber dam in ensuring precision and efficacy during operative on primary teeth. But that's just the beginning. Part 2 of our series, Pulp Therapy in Primary Teeth, delves deeper into the realm of pulp therapy, unraveling the mysteries surrounding hall crown, indirect and direct pulp capping, DPC, pulpotomy, and vital pulpectomy. Join us as we navigate through the comp spectrum of pediatric dental care, unlocking insights and strategies to enhance patient outcomes and promote oral health excellence. Five Golden Rules for Delivering Top-Notch Dental Care to Kids Establish trust and cooperation, building a positive rapport with both the child and parent is essential. This involves effective communication, empathy, and creating a comfortable environment to alleviate anxiety and foster trust. Accurate diagnosis and tailored treatment plans, conduct thorough assessments to identify the child's dental needs, considering their age, oral health status, and any unique factors. Develop personalized treatment plans that address these needs effectively. Comprehensive preventive care. Prioritize preventive measures such as regular cleanings, treatments, sealants, and education on proper oral hygiene habits. This proactive approach helps minimize the risk of dental issues and promotes long-term oral health. Patient-centered care delivery. Adapt care delivery methods to suit the child's preferences and comfort level. Utilize child-friendly language, behavioral techniques, and tools such as distraction or relaxation techniques to ensure a positive experience during treatments. Cost-effective long-lasting solutions. Utilize evidence-based treatment methods and restorative techniques that offer optimal outcomes in terms of durability, functionality, and aesthetics. Strive for solutions that provide value for money while maintaining the child's oral health in the long term. This involves considering factors such as material durability, longevity, and the potential need for future interventions. Considerations for removing, restoring, or leaving carious lesions. Let's talk about reasons why sometimes we might decide not to treat certain dental issues. Reasons not to treat. Damage from treatment. Impact on the affected tooth. Removal of sound tissue during operative treatment weakens the tooth, increasing the risk of future issues such as tooth cracking or pulp vitality loss. Impact on adjacent tooth. Treating approximal lesions may damage the adjacent tooth, removing its fluoride reservoir and potentially increasing susceptibility to caries. Impact on periodontal tissues. Dental treatment, particularly for approximal caries, can cause acute and long-term damage to periodontal tissues affecting interdental papillae and leading to gingivitis. Impact on occlusion. Poor restoration can alter occlusion over time, causing significant disturbances, particularly if multiple poorly restored teeth cumulatively affection. Difficulty of diagnosis. Dental caries diagnosis is challenging, with variations between examiners and even the same examiner on different occasions. Bite-wing radiographs can aid in diagnosis but accuracy remains a concern. Slow rate of caries attack. This typically progresses slowly, especially in older children, with variations in the rate of progression among individuals. Rapidly developing caries may necessitate more frequent radiographs for monitoring, potential for remineralization. Early enamel lesions can undergo remineralization, effectively arresting and repairing caries. Fluoride plays a crucial role in encouraging remineralization, making remineralized lesions more resistant to caries. Effective oral hygiene practices are essential for remineralization. Short lifespan of dental restorations. Dental restorations have a limited lifespan, with a significant proportion failing within a few years of placement. Studies show varying success rates for restorations in primary teeth, raising questions about the necessity of treatment. Conclusion. Various factors, including potential damage from treatment, diagnostic challenges, the rate of caries progression, remineralization potential, and the lifespan of restorations, 
influence the decision not to treat carious lesions in primary teeth. Reasons to treat carious lesions, adverse effects of neglect. Neglecting treatment can lead to severe consequences such as loss of contact with adjacent and opposing teeth, exposure of the pulp, leading to periapical infection, potential loss of the tooth, necessitating extraction, possible need for general anesthesia for tooth removal, accompanied by facial swelling and hospitalization with intravenous antibiotics. Rare cases may lead to lethal complications from untreated decay. Unpredictability of the speed of attack. While caries progression is typically slow, some individuals may experience rapid decay, necessitating timely treatment to prevent further damage. Difficulty in assessing lesion arrest. It's challenging to determine if a lesion is arrested or developing slowly. Remineralization primarily affects early enamel lesions, with limited evidence of remineralization in dentin or lamel lesions. Success with careful treatment. Published studies may suggest poor longevity of restorations in primary teeth, but careful treatment by skilled dentists yields favorable outcomes. Dentists who adhere to good principles of restorative dentistry demonstrate high success rates in their restorations. This should be on developing better treatment approaches rather than dismissing treatment due to perceived challenges. Early treatment is more successful. Small restorations have higher success rates than large ones, advocating for early treatment of carious lesions. Early intervention, such as prophylactic fillings or phalance, helps prevent the need for extensive restorative procedures. Balancing the timing of preventive procedures with the need for early intervention poses challenges in caries management. Conclusion Despite potential challenges and uncertainties, Treating carious lesions in primary teeth is essential to prevent adverse consequences, ensure successful outcomes, and promote optimal oral health for children. Reasons to treat carious lesions When considering whether to remove or restore a carious primary tooth, several factors must be taken into account. The child Individualized treatment planning is essential, prioritizing the child's best interests over convenience for parents or dentists. Studies that tooth extraction under local anesthesia can induce dental anxiety in children, unlike restorative care. Despite risks and discomfort, tooth removal under general anesthesia is still prevalent in the UK, emphasizing the need to prioritize the child's well-being. The tooth. Preservation of permanent teeth is paramount. Dentive treatment may be required if the pulp of a carious permanent tooth is exposed, with a poor prognosis. Early loss of primary teeth can negatively impact a child's perception of dental care, emphasizing the importance of saving and restoring primary teeth to instill good oral hygiene habits. Well-restored primary dentitions as a source of pride for children and encourages them to care for their succeeding teeth. The stage of disease. Early intervention is preferable, as restoration becomes more challenging once the pulp is involved, increasing the likelihood of tooth loss. The extent of disease. Treating multiple teeth may strain a child and their caregivers, highlighting the importance of effective and efficient treatment. Despite a decrease in caries prevalence among children over the past two decades, the dental profession struggles to provide effective restorative care, evident in decreasing care indices. Conclusion. Decisions regarding the removal and restoration of carious primary teeth should prioritize the child's well-being. Aim to preserve permanent teeth, intervene early, and efficiently manage the extent of disease. Efforts must be made to improve restorative care and halt the decline in care indices to ensure optimal oral health outcomes for children. Reasons to treat carious lesions When considering whether to remove or restore a carious primary tooth, several factors must be taken into account. The child Individualized treatment planning is essential prioritizing the child's best interests over convenience for parents or dentists. Studies that tooth extraction under local anesthesia can induce dental anxiety in children, unlike restorative care. Despite risks and discomfort, tooth removal under general anesthesia is still prevalent in the UK, emphasizing the need to prioritize the child's well-being. The tooth. Preservation of permanent teeth is paramount, Extensive treatment may be required if the pulp of a carious permanent tooth is exposed, with a poor prognosis. Early loss of primary teeth can negatively impact a child's perception of dental care, 
emphasizing the importance of saving and restoring primary teeth to instill good oral hygiene habits. Well-restored primary dentition serves as a source of pride for children and encourages them to care for their succeeding teeth. The stage of disease. Early intervention is preferable, as restoration becomes more challenging once the pulp is involved, increasing the likelihood of tooth loss. The extent of disease. Treating multiple teeth may strain child and their caregivers, highlighting the importance of effective and efficient treatment. Despite a decrease in caries prevalence among children over the past two decades, the dental profession struggles to provide effective restorative care, evident in decreasing care indices. Conclusion Decisions regarding the removal restoration of carious primary teeth should prioritize the child's well-being, aim to preserve permanent teeth, intervene early, and efficiently manage the extent of disease. Efforts must be made to improve restorative care and halt the decline in care indices to ensure optimal oral health outcomes for children. Treatment Planning Considerations in Planning Motivation and Compliance of Child and Parent Extent and Location of Decay Age of Patient and Expected Tooth Survival Presence of Symptoms and Pulp Health Formulating a Treatment Plan Tailored to the Needs and Circumstances Logical approach, often treating a quadrant at a time. Priority on gaining child's confidence and minimizing discomfort. Implementing treatment. Local anesthesia essential for pain control. Initial visits may focus on introducing child to operative environment. Subsequent visits follow a systematic approach, starting with simple procedures. Rubber dam usage enhances restoration quality and aids in behavior management. Pulpotomies or pulpectomies required for teeth with pulpal involvement. Preformed metal crowns recommended for restored teeth with pulpal involvement. Provision of preventive advice integral to each visit. Conclusion. Accurate diagnosis and comprehensive treatment planning are crucial in managing caries in primary dentition. Treatment plans should prioritize the child's well-being and aim for long-term oral health outcomes. Implementation of treatment focus on minimizing discomfort, maximizing cooperation, and providing high-quality restorative care alongside preventive measures. Durability of restorations in primary teeth, silver amalgam. Despite being non-tooth colored, silver amalgam has been used for over 150 years. Recent randomized trials found no significant differences in outcomes compared to composite materials. Relatively easy to use, tolerant of operator, and economically viable. Modern non-gamma-2 alloy restorations have extended lifetimes under good conditions and generally outperform other materials in clinical trials and retrospective studies. Stainless steel crowns. Introduced in 1950 and widely accepted in North America, preferred for primary molars with extensive caries, showing higher success rates than other restorative materials in primary teeth. Rarely need replacement due to recurrent or new caries. Recommended for hypoplastic slash hypomineralized or severely carious first permanent molars as provisional restorations. Composite resin. Came on the market in the early 1970s. Sensitivity to technique variations and long replacement time compared to amalgam. Long-term success jeopardized by water instability. Similar longevity to resin-modified glass ionomer cement. RMGIC, or compomer fertile and small proximal restorations in primary teeth, but inferior results compared to amalgam for permanent molars restoration. Glass ionomer. Came on the market in the late 1970s. High fluoride content provides sustained fluoride release and acts as a rechargeable fluoride reservoir. To enamel and dentin without acid etching, stable in high humidity conditions. Not recommended for proximal cavities in primary molars due to poor results over time. Resin-modified glass ionomer cements, RMGIX. Consist of glass ionomer cement with added resin system. Sets quickly with low chemical catalysts while retaining essential qualities of glass ionomer cement. Survival similar to composite, amalgam, and compomer in some studies. Polyacid-modified composite resin, compomer. Easier to use but doubts about long-term benefits compared to conventional composite resins. Performance poorer than amalgam in long-term studies. Conclusion
Selection of restorative material for primary teeth should consider factors like extent of caries, operator skill, and long-term success rates. Stainless steel crowns remain the preferred option for primary molars, with extensive caries due to their high rates and durability. Composite resins, glass ionomers, rmjics, and compomers have specific advantages and limitations, and their use should be tailored to individual cases. Rubber dam in pediatric dentistry, benefits and considerations. Rubber dam is a valuable tool in pediatric dentistry, offering various safety and procedural benefits for both patients and dental professionals. Let's delve into its significance and advantages. Safety measures. Soft tissue protection. By shielding soft tissues from dental instruments, rubber dam misses the risk of inadvertent damage during procedures. Risk reduction. It lowers the likelihood of accidental ingestion or inhalation of instruments or materials, promoting a safer treatment environment. Infection control. Rubber dam helps mitigate the spread of saliva aerosols reducing the potential for cross-infection dental staff and patients. Sedation enhancement. During nitrous oxide sedation, rubber dam aids in directing exhaled gases through the scavenging system, ensuring safety for both patients and staff. Benefits to the child. Isolation comfort. Rubber dam provides a sense of security by isolating medaria, alleviating anxiety related to vital bodily functions like sight, hearing, breathing, and swallowing. Relaxation promotion. The isolation effect often induces greater relaxation in children, with some even drifting off to sleep during treatment, particularly when coupled with effective pain management. Free alternatives. Latex-free options cater to children with latex sensitivities or allergies, ensuring their safety and comfort during procedures. Advantages for the dentist. Stress reduction. Rubber dam placement minimizes risks to the child during treatment fostering a calmer and more controlled clinical atmosphere, reducing stress for the dental team. Enhanced visibility, by gently retracting oral tissues, rubber dam improves visibility of the operative field, facilitating easier and more efficient treatment. Moisture control, ensuring a dry operating field, rubber dam aids in the optimal performance of restorative material, contributing to the longevity and success of dental restorations. In summary, rubber dam utilization in pediatric dentistry offers multifaceted advantages, ranging from safety enhancements to procedural efficiency, ultimately leading to improved patient experiences and treatment outcome. Considerations for rubber dam use in pediatric dentistry. Initial learning curve. Mastery of rubber dam placement may entail some initial learning, requiring dental professionals to familiarize themselves with the technique. Despite this learning curve, the long-term advantages, such as enhanced safety and efficiency, justify the investment of time and effort. Patient cooperation. Successful rubber dam placement hinges on patient cooperation, particularly in pediatric dentistry. However, children typically adapt well to the procedure once they grasp its advantages, such as increased comfort and safety during treatment. Equipment availability. The availability of rubber dam equipment may vary among dental practices, potentially posing a challenge for implementation. Investing in rubber dam supplies is beneficial, as it substantially enhances the quality of pediatric dental care, promoting safer and more effective procedures. In conclusion, while there may be initial hurdles to overcome, integrating rubber dam usage into pediatric dental practice offers significant advantages. The technique enhances safety for both patients and dental staff, improves treatment outcomes, and contributes to a more positive overall patient experience. Therefore, despite potential challenges, the adoption of rubber dam in pediatric dentistry is highly advantageous and worthy of consideration. Technique for applying rubber dam in pediatric dentistry. Analgesia. Begin by administering soft tissue analgesia using infiltration in the buccal sulcus, followed by an interpapillary injection. This helps alleviate discomfort associated with the placement of rubber dam. Method of application. Preparation. Cut a 5-inch square of medium rubber dam. Punch a single hole in the middle of the square for the tooth to be isolated with a winged clamp. Punch additional holes for any other teeth to be isolated. Assembly. Stretch the rubber dam over an ivory frame, ensuring it covers higher frame evenly.
Place the winged clamp in the first hole of the rubber dam. Placement. Use clamp forceps to carry the assembled clamp, dam, and frame to the tooth. Apply the clamp to the designated tooth through the hole in the dam, ensuring it is secured firmly. Tease the dam off the wings of using fingers or a hand instrument. Carry the dam forward over the other teeth, gently guiding it through the contact areas. Stabilize the dam as needed using floss, a small piece of rubber dam, a wedge jet, or a wooden wedge at the front. By following these steps, dental professionals can effectively apply rubber dam in pediatric dentistry, facilitating safer and more efficient dental procedures while ensuring patient comfort and cooperation. Advantages of this technique Simplicity Assembling the clamp, dam, and frame together before application minimizes the risk of dropping or breaking the clamp, simplifying the process. Efficiency The entire assembly can be carried to the tooth in one movement, saving time and reducing the for additional securing materials like floss. This increases efficiency during the procedure. Patient comfort Minimizes discomfort for the patient by ensuring a smooth and efficient application process without the need for additional manipulation of the clamp. This enhances patient comfort, especially in pediatric cases cooperation is essential. By offering simplicity, efficiency, and enhanced patient comfort, this technique facilitates the effective application of rubber dam in pediatric dentistry, ultimately improving the overall dental experience for both the dentist and the patient. Operative treatment of primary teeth Pitt and Fisher caries. Pitt and Fisher caries in primary teeth are less common but indicate high caries activity when present. Treatment involves infiltration analgesia with supplemental interpapillary injection. Caries removal is done using a 330 burr and a high-speed handpiece. Various materials can be used for restoration, with silver amalgam being a common choice due to its clinical success. Sealing the remaining fissures with materials like sealants helps prevent future caries development. Approximal caries. Silver amalgam. Commonly used for approximal restorations in primary teeth. Failures may occur due to amalgam itself or faults in cavity design. Modifications in cavity design, such as reducing the size of the occlusal lock and creating rounded line angles, help in durability. The minimal approximal cavity with no occlusal dovetail, is described for both amalgam and adhesive restorations. Challenges in cavity design include widened contact areas, thin enamel, and potential tooth where under occlusal stress. Alternative materials discussed earlier may be considered for small cavities. Stainless steel crowns. Recommended for larger cavities, concern for further caries development, or cases under sedation or general anesthesia. Minimize the need for further restorative care until exfoliation by providing long-lasting coverage for the tooth. Conclusion Operative treatment of primary teeth involves careful consideration of cavity size, material choice, and long-term durability. While silver amalgam remains a viable option for many cases, stainless steel crowns may be preferred for larger or high-risk cavities. Indications for stainless steel crowns Restoration of primary molars, needing large multi-surface restorations. Restoration of primary molars in children with rampant caries. Restorative care, provided under sedation or general anesthetic. Restoration of teeth after pulp therapy. Restoration of teeth with developmental defects, e.g. amelogenesis imperfecta. Abutment for space maintainers. Restoration of fractured primary molars. Protection of molars in children with bruxism. Restoration of hypomineralized young permanent molars. Technique. Prior to placement, local anesthesia is recommended for patient comfort, although topical anesthesia may suffice in some cases. Rubber dam isolation is advisable to protect the airway and facilitate the procedure. Preparation involves caries removal, pulp treatment if necessary, and return of the tooth structure. Mesial and distal surfaces are removed using a fine tapered diamond burr, avoiding damage to adjacent teeth and ensuring no shoulder is created at the gingival margin. SSCs are retained by contact between the crown margins and the undercut portion of the tooth below the gingiva, so the shape of the preparation above the gingiva is relatively unimportant. 
The crown is tried on and checked for proper fit within the gingival crevice, before cementation with glass ionomer cement. Success Rates Over the past few decades, SSCs have consistently shown higher success rates compared to other restorations in primary molars. SSCs rarely need replacement once placed and provide long-term protection against further caries. Children generally express positive opinions about the appearance of SSCs and find the placement procedure acceptable. Conclusion Stainless steel crowns are highly durable restorations for primary molars and are preferred for cases where materials may not survive until exfoliation. Their superior longevity and protective properties make them a valuable treatment option in pediatric dentistry, a rubber dam and wedges in place, pulpotomy and coronal. Reduction completed. B. Mesial and distal surfaces reduced. C. Crown try-in. D. Cementation of crown. E. Excess cement removed prior to rubber dam. R removal and occlusal analysis. F. Some operators recommend perforating the approximal surface of the stainless steel crown to allow release of fluoride. From GIC. Treatment of decay in primary anterior teeth. The treatment of caries in primary anterior teeth, particularly extensive decay in upper primary incisors, requires careful consideration of various factors to determine the most appropriate restoration technique. Strip crown technique. Indication, rated for extensive decay in upper primary incisors where satisfactory cavities cannot be prepared for traditional restorations. Procedure. Involves using celluloid crown forms and light-cured composite resin to restore the affected teeth effectively. Technique, trimming the crowns with sharp scissors, filling them with composite, and seating repaired and conditioned teeth. The celluloid crown form can be removed after curing the composite. Considerations, feasible under general anesthesia in young children due to the need for cooperation. Provides excellent restoration for primary incisors with extensive tissue loss due to caries or trauma. A. Carious primary incisors. Primary incisors affected by dental caries, leading to decay and potential loss of tooth structure. B. Restored using strip crowns and composite resins to give an aesthetically pleasing result. The decayed primary incisors were restored using a combination of strip crowns and composite resin to achieve both functional and aesthetic restoration. The strip crowns were utilized to rebuild the damaged tooth structure, providing a durable and protective covering. Composite resins were then applied to the crowns to enhance aesthetics, mimicking the natural appearance of the teeth and ensuring a pleasing smile. This comprehensoration approach not only addresses the decay, but also restores the natural appearance and function of the affected primary incisors, resulting in a satisfactory outcome for both the patient and the dental practitioner. Fractured incisal edges. Treatment, restore fractured incisal edges with composite resin. Purpose, restores function and aesthetics, preventing further damage and deterioration of affected teeth. Procedure. Composite resin is applied to the fractured edges and shaped to restore the natural contour and appearance of the tooth. Benefits, provides a durable and aesthetically pleasing restoration, preserving the integrity and function of the affected teeth. Choice of restoration. Factors to consider. The choice of restoration depends on factors such as the child's cooperation, symptoms, extent of destruction, pulpal assessment, and parental aspirations. New lesions in older children, new lesions on primary incisors in older children may indicate high caries activity. Restoration options include glass ionomer cement or composite resin. Glass ionomer cement, adhesive and releases fluoride but lacks translucency and may struggle with long-term retention. Composite resin, preferred if good moisture control is present, offering better aesthetics and retention over the term. Conclusion Variability in treatment. Treatment of decay in primary anterior teeth varies based on the child's age, extent of decay, and cooperation. Consideration of factors. The choice between strip crowns, glass ionomer cement, and composite resin depends on various factors, including aesthetics, retention, and moisture control.